Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is well caffeinated. caffeinated. Uh, we're getting close to lunch, so I can imagine that people are getting tired and hungry. So I hope I can keep you awake for a little, bu little while longer. So, as I was introduced, my name is Ja. Uh, I'm actually from Amsterdam. I'm a developer advocate at Wilwick. Not the only developer advocate here, so it saves me from having to explain what I do. Thank you. <laughs> um, I actually, uh, to give a little bit of context uh, where I'm coming from and uh, what kind of context I'm uh, giving this talk from, I come from a system engineering background, and not the cool kind of system engineer, but a Microsoft engineer, so... <laughs> Did not expect that. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, but I quickly got drawn into automation that eventually led me down the path uh, to building out uh, APIs and SDKs on top of that. So, uh, yeah, I also like Quakas, so... For people who don't know what quackas are, quackas are cute kind of kangaroo animals from Australia. Um, someone at work decided that I was allowed to name projects, so now my, my first project was called Quacka. So. <laughs> and I try to sneak them in any presentation where I can get away with it. So uh, if you spot the quacka at any point during my presentation, let me know and I'll give you some swag. <laughs> Just shout quacka. So, um, I found this image, uh, this is from, uh, from about 2,000 years ago, a little bit longer even. This was when Hannibal was crossing over the Alps, and he was bringing elephants, and elephants are really big animals, but they're not really well suited for going to the mountains. So, the reason I got this, uh, I got this picture is because I'm talking about advancing my API strategy. I haven't quite conquered it yet. So it's my lessons learned, but there's a lot more to learn. So I'd like to hear your feedback afterwards as well. I'll be around most of the day today. So what do I have uh, for you today? Uh, I'll be talking about uh, uh, the API I'm working with. Uh, I'm talking about the kind of people I'm targeting with, uh, with the work I'm doing. Uh, our work with open sourcing it and what we've seen once we started doing that, so that's open sourcing uh, not only our API but also our API documentation and our SDKs on top of that. And then I'll finish up with closing the loop and the Q&A will just be in the hallway and during lunch. Cool. So what kind of uh, API am I working with? So. Uh, my company is in the backup and data management uh, sphere, so this is not a very typical area where APIs are prevalent, because most of, uh, most of the stuff that we do is uh, automating backups or assigning SOAs or uh, doing, uh, doing DR scenarios using our, uh, using our APIs. Uh, the nice thing is, though, is that uh, from, from the start, our product was built up with an API-first approach, which I think is cool because then I can automate against it, because I honestly don't really care that much about backup. It's not recorded, right? <laughs> it is, actually. <laughs> uh, there we go. Yeah, was developer advocate until the 10th of October. <laughs> So what are, the, what are the challenges in, this, uh, in, the, in the space that I'm in? Well, because uh, APIs are relatively, relatively new here, there's uh, still a lack of understanding uh, from people what, uh, what APIs are or what you, can actually, uh, what you can actually do with them. For me that's great because that gives me a lot of opportunity to, to talk about what, what you can actually do with APIs and how you can improve your workflows by, by utilizing what we, uh, what we have. Because most of, the, uh, most of the traditional tools are more based on, uh, on GUIs or leg legacy tools like command line tools or, uh, or other kinds of interactions. And then you kind of end up like the Lamborghini in the middle of a flock of sheep. So the Lamborghini being an API. So that's the external uh, external uh, 
uh, external landscape. So what is the internal space? So I already mentioned, so we have an API first approach, so everything is accessible to the API. When I say everything, of course not everything, because we don't want people to break stuff, so some stuff is only available uh, if you have a support token. Uh, some API endpoints are classified as internal, which, which I don't really like, because internal means that developers can change it at any point. It's very nice for developers, but it's not very nice for, for our end users, because if it's classified as internal, should I be using this, or can I actually be using this because of the, the internal guidelines my organization has? So this is something that, uh, that we're actively moving, uh, moving away from. And we have an open API spec, and open API specs are really cool because you can actually, uh, actually your entire uh, structure of API endpoints is defined and uh, you can expose this and automatically generate documentation based on this. So, the happy dog and the sad dog. There's going to be a lot of animals in here. I was thinking of putting animated ones in there, but it would, would have probably become too much. So. So, <laughs> who, who are we trying to who are we trying to reach uh, with this? Uh, we, we have quite a diverse audience, so a lot of lot of different dogs. <laughs> so, so we have some we have some different ones. We we have people that are at the wheel, but. They don't really know what's what's going on with uh, with automation, integration, or APIs. So these are uh, are technical people, but they might not be ut utilizing APIs yet, or they might just not know what what is possible uh, by using APIs. Then we have the uh, I don't actually know what kind of dog it is. If anyone knows, let me know. Irish Sutter. Irish Sutter. Irish Setter. Setter. Okay, cool. I, I actually tried googling for brown dog, but that <laughs> did not give me the <laughs> So, uh, th that's, a, that's a technical user, that is uh, someone that's actively uh, writing code or writing scripts or working with APIs. And these are the kind of people that, that have a lot of feedback and also are quite demanding, because if something doesn't work, they'll be very vocal about that. So, that's uh, another persona we're dealing with, and then we have the quaka, and in this case, the quaka is the, the non-technical stakeholder. So the business, uh, uh, the business stakeholder, or uh, a decision maker who uh, will have to make a uh, have to make an informed decision based on whatever we provide them. I think this is the last quaka I actually put in the slide. So I'm sorry if anyone was expecting one. So. The beginning uh, API user, so the dog behind the wheel, is very happy, but doesn't really know what's going on. <laughs> so, what we do for those kind of users is, we try to simplify API access. And one of the ways we do this is by providing modules or uh, SDKs. So, if that user is very first but in using Python or using PowerShell, PowerShell is my personal favorite tool, or Go, we have a number of SDKs available, and we also have documentation available for these uh, for these uh, SDKs and modules. So we make it simpler to interact with uh, with our API, and then also uh, provide use cases because you can provide them with tools to actually do something with the API. But if they have no idea what they can do, then it's still kind of useless. You made it easier, but they still don't know what to do with it. So we provided a number of a uh, number of use cases there, and then we have uh, documentation because we want our documentation to be easily available. Uh, follow Lona's advice, put it up on GitHub, make it look good, not as good as Lona. But. And video tutorials because some people like video. I don't like video personally because it takes a lot of time, and I t like to skim to documentation. So. Then we have our uh, technical user, I guess Seller, I think. So 
this person wants to have access to code, wants to be able to wants to be able to see uh, what is going on, and also wants to be able to contribute to this code. So we have to provide them with uh, with a way to not only get to our code, but also give them a, a point of contact so they can reach out to make it uh, make it easier for them to to find us and. This is something where our documentation helps as well by providing multiple contacts, uh, multiple contact points. So it can be Twitter, it can be it can be Slack. Uh, we have a number a number of issues for, for for the legacy people. We even have an email address which I never check. <laughs> <laughs> Someone does, clearly. And then we have the, the non-technical stakeholder, so the, the happy quacka, smiles at everything you say, and we just, we just have to put some logos up there, and <laughs> looks good. And, and for, for those users, we've also created a, a separate portal, uh, and on that separate portal, we uh, we exposed a number of a number of use cases and integrations, so they can see the fancy icons and tick their boxes, and come end up being very happy. So then we get to uh, we get to open sourcing because having a lot of cool stuff out there is one thing, but uh, we're not a huge team, so by open sourcing. Uh, we uh, we can also get our feedback in a uh, in a faster and more more structured way. So we also put our API documentation up on GitHub, which sounds like an easy thing. But if anyone has a legal team in their organization, <laughs> not that easy. Uh, we created a quick start guides. So this is for the for, for the non-technical users. They just want to know what's possible. Give them a give them a quick start guide so they know what is possible with your uh, with your API, and they can just copy paste some stuff in there and actually actually get started. Um, I'm lucky because we have some great technical writers in our organization. So whenever um, whenever something wasn't up to spec, they would just went to it and I would get a long-winded email. Those are the emails I do, do read. <laughs> I, I would get a long-winded email with things that were incorrect. But because we put it up on GitHub, we actually, uh, we actually got in pull requests from, from our technical writers who had never used GitHub before. And it even got to the point where we had people from marketing going over our website or going over our contributions. And with a little bit of coaching, they started doing pull requests. So that's actually really cool that uh, by, by open sourcing it and by making it more accessible, you're going to, uh, you're going to grow the number of contributors uh, significantly. And you get help from unexpected uh, angles. The other thing we did is, uh, as a growing organization, uh, our GitHub presence was a bit spread out. So we we had multiple uh, 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 multiple organizations in which we uh, we had repositories. So what we did is we we centralized everything under a single organization, and we made sure to assign rights that actually make sense, not make everyone an admin, that's probably a bad idea, although everyone wants to be an admin. Uh, we've standardized our readme.md and one of the ways we've done that is by, uh, by creating a Slack integration. Uh, as I mentioned, I don't like email very much, so I get most of my work through Slack. So we built a Slack integration, so you can do slash build repo and we, we can automatically generate a new repository. So anyone in the organization who wants to do something on GitHub can get a new repository by running this command. And they get a bunch of options in Slack and uh, rights are automatically assigned. So that uh, made it a lot easier for us to, uh, for us to manage. And uh, another big thing was uh, making sure that the labels for all the repositories are uh, are the same, because the labels uh, have helped us a lot. So, finishing up from what we've learned so far, um, 
people are actually looking for ways to interact with us. Um, we're still getting uh, we're still getting reports of people that can't find us or don't know how they can reach us. So we try to have a, a as broad as possible approach. So we have Twitter. It means my Twitter handle is underneath, so that's quite easy to find. Uh, Twitter. Make sure we uh, we put this in the documentation. Uh, Slack um, on GitHub. Uh, we've uh, defined a number of issue templates. So for whether it's a bug report or an enhancement request, or uh, we're, we're still a bit on the fence whether we should allow questions or not. I know some some organizations do. We don't yet. Uh, I'm on team questions. So anyone has any convincing arguments to help me out to getting questions on GitHub, let me know. Um, uh, the labels that benefited us the most were actually uh, the first timer and help wanted. So, what I've been doing is going to our repositories and finding some easy fixes and tagging them as help wanted and first timers. So, you find a small, uh, small uh, spelling error or a small mistake in your uh, in one of the repositories. Instead of fixing it myself, I would just raise an issue and kind of kind of hope it would get picked up or throw it on an internal uh, internal Slack channel or. Throw it up on Twitter and see if anyone wants to uh, wants to start the debate here. Uh, other than that, uh, not everyone is familiar with uh, with GitHub. So the earlier example I mentioned, when we got uh, people from the marketing department uh, to uh, to help out on uh, on GitHub. Uh, they did require a bit of hand-holding. And one of the things that I found quite efficient is uh, whenever I'm, I'm helping a person, a team, or a group of people out, make a recording of this and make this available, either publicly or on your internal, uh, on your internal wiki or whatever kind of, uh, whatever kind of internal uh, portal you have. So that's something that made my life easier, because if I can point someone to a video, it's less work than jumping on a call for half an hour. Uh, the other thing we noticed that uh, if a project is very active, if there's a lot of active development going on, uh, you can work really hard, but once people start noticing that things get picked up, you're going to get a lot of new issues or new, uh, new contributions. So. One of the things we started uh, we started working on a lot is uh, automating uh, automating our approvals on GitHub, making sure we have proper unit tests for everything, so we can shorten our approval cycle for uh, for pull requests. So the future, the things uh, the things we're still uh, we're still looking at or are still in uh, in early stages. Some of the things uh, we're, we're running into, because most of, uh, most of our customers or partners are actually legacy enterprise companies, and they hear open source, and open source sounds scary, because we, we get a question like, but anyone can just contribute code, so how do you know that there's no bad code in there? So one of the things we're doing is we uh, we started building out uh, specific CI pipelines that uh, check for security uh, security breaches. So for example, if there's going to be very big base64 things in your code, then it's probably obfuscated code, and someone is trying to do something bad. Or if there's external IP addresses in there, that's probably not good. Maybe someone is trying to exfiltrate data out of it. So we started implementing uh, implementing that. Another thing we're looking at is uh, using machine translation for our documentation to make it more uh, to make it more accessible, but also um, uh, extracting our documentation, making it external because currently a lot of our documentation is just inside of the scripts and inside of the code. If you put it inside the code, it's very hard to get it out and to make it uh, multilingual. So we're currently exploring different ways to, to make it more accessible so a broader range of people can, can actually use our documentation. Um, with that, I'll be around for most of the day. Thank you for your time. Uh,
Have a nice day.